Hello, and welcome to Mel Make Stuff. My name is Melissa, and this is episode 18. In my previous episode, I have shown you all of my current colorwork projects. So for this episode, we are going to take a look at all of my non-colorwork projects. My current goal at this moment is to try to totally clear my needles by the end of the year. So all of my colorwork projects done and everything I'm about to show you done. And if that's the case, I'm gonna put out another episode before the end of the year that has all of these things finished in one episode and it will just be like a giant FO celebration. So now I've said it, we'll see if I can do it. So for today's episode, I have two finished objects to show you and I also have two new projects that you haven't seen yet. So let's get started. Both of my finished projects for this episode are from this edition of Pom Pom Magazine. This is spring 2022. The first one that I have is the Plumeti. Here is what the original looked like, if you recall. And here are some shots of me modeling it. So the first thing that you will probably notice is that I did decide to leave the sleeves off this. This is about to become a major theme in my, my crafting, so just be ready. I have left the sleeves off and I'm planning to leave the sleeves off a number of things. For this project, I used the Pearl Soho Tussock, which is their mohair base in the balsam green colorway. That's the main color of the body. And then for the cuffs, collar, and hem, I used Malabrigo Sock can't quite remember the name of the colorway, but I'll put it down below in the description box. Because I was initially planning to leave the sleeves on this thing, I now have a ton of this mohair left over, which wasn't really the plan, but it's a beautiful color. I'm sure I can use it elsewhere. And also I barely used any of the Malabrigo. So really it's sort of like, I could easily make another one of these probably with sleeves still. Here is how much I have left over of that Malabrigo. So this is a, a beautiful colorway. So I'm definitely gonna be able to use this again as well. I am really happy with how this finished garment turned out. And as much as I was debating on whether I would wear like a what essentially is a mohair t-shirt, what I have come to realize is that I have a lot of garments that I've made that are sewn cardigans, like uh, sweatshirt material or linen cardigans or things like that. And these types of tops are perfect to wear underneath those. So it feels maybe a little bit odd sometimes to double up with a sweater underneath and then a knitted cardigan on top, although I am certainly not above doing that and have been doing it a lot lately. But for going out, it is maybe a little bit of a nicer look to have different textures between the cardigan and what I'm wearing underneath. So I do like that. Just to show you a couple of the details here. So this little collar is super cute. So that is the front and then it closes in the back with this little button, which I happen to have in my stash and the light is so bright today, but it perfectly matches both of these colors. It's sort of like a, a pearlized greeny blue. So the body and the collar I had knitted according to pattern. I did size down because I wanted less ease up front, I had already decided I wanted less ease than shown in the original pattern. I didn't like how far down that drop shoulder came on the model. So I knew I wanted that to be up a little bit higher from the start. And then when I decided to leave the sleeves off, I felt like that shoulder was already in a sort of nice position to be sort of like a cap sleeve length, which is a length that I really like on myself. So the tricky thing that I had to figure out as far as the modification was how to finish the armhole, because of course it was, you know, you were meant to add a sleeve on here. And so what I ended up doing, as you can see, is an I-cord. And now picking up stitches off of a, a pattern like this pattern on the body, this stitch pattern. And with this having been, you know, this very open mohair, I had to take a couple different stabs at how many stitches to pick up to have this I-cord be an appropriate length for how wide I wanted my armhole to be. And I basically followed the directions for the neckline. So if you can see, and I do remember talking about this the last time, for the neckline, you pick up stitches. It describes how to pick up stitches all around the mohair body for this I-cord. You knit the I-cord first, and then you pick up these collar pieces and knit them down off of that I-cord. And so I essentially went back to those directions and used those to pick up. I think initially I'd picked up the same amount of stitches around the armhole as I had for the neckline. And then that turned out to be a little bit too big. So I ripped it out after it was totally done and like bound off, I ripped it out and then went back and picked up a couple fewer stitches and then that worked out. So this actually ended up being quite a quick knit without 
having to do the sleeves. I did screw around uh, when I was trying to figure out the armhole. Like there was, you know, I set it aside for a while because I knew it was gonna take a little bit of futzing around to figure out how many stitches I need to pick up and all of that. But once I sat down to do it, it was like that. I finished it in two days maybe. And I could actually see knitting another one of these in a different color, again, without the sleeves. I don't think I'll do it right away, but maybe in the future. And the second finished object that I have to show you is what I am wearing. This is the Nerides, also from the same issue of Pom Pom. So here is the original pattern, and again, you can see that I took the sleeves off of this. So that was not necessarily my choice. <laughs> what happened was I had knit the full sleeve on this thing. And if you recall from the last episode, I do remember saying that I was a little bit worried about the length of the sleeve because on the model, it hits right in the middle of the arm. This photo shows that length a little bit better. And because I have very short arms, I was worried about that being an unflattering length on me. So I did knit the entire sleeve and I had, I think even bound it off and I tried it on. It was still, I had not cut my yarn yet. So the yarn was still attached and I tried it on. And when I held my arm up, I mean, the, the length of the sleeve did look strange on me. I mean, I was right about that, but also it just wasn't draping correctly. And I think the reason for that is my yarn choice. So if you recall, when I talked about this before, the pattern is written for two strands of mohair held together and a fingering weight strand of linen. So you have three strands held together as you're knitting this entire thing, which Honestly, this stitch pattern is a little bit of a pain and I, I, I'm i sure it would be fine with the three strands held together, but I wanted to switch that because I, I didn't want to have the expense of two strands of mohair and you know, whatever. I wanted to use yarn for my stash. I did end up buying the linen to go with this. And so I use this Euroflax linen, which is a sport weight. So I did go up in the weight of this base yarn. I held that together with some mohair I had in my stash, which is this Knitting for Olive mohair in the deep petroleum blue colorway. So you can see that is almost an exact match to these colors. I think ideally I would have wanted this to be a little bit lighter than the mohair, but I was ordering online and blah, blah, blah. So I was working with what I had at that point. So when I tried this on and I had taken a photo of myself, you know, with my arm out like this, and I had sent the photo to my friends, Selma and Miga, and I was like, what do you guys think about this? Like, just, what do you think? Let me know, I'm not sure about it. And they were both like, hmm. And you know, from, from just that response, it's like, yeah, okay, we all agree it's not working. And Selma mentioned that it might be my yarn choice. And I was like, oh, you're totally right. If I had used those two strands of mohair, held together with the fingering weight strand of linen, it would be a much lighter fabric. And these yarns held together, I think are totally fine for the body. I'm happy with the sort of drape of the body, but for the sleeve, it was a little bit too heavy. So at that point I had a couple of options. I did have enough of this mohair that I could have probably held at least two strands of it together, maybe three, and done the sleeves with just the mohair. But I was like, you know, this might look kind of nice without the sleeves. So let me try that. So once I had decided to take the sleeve off and just finish the armhole, I was like, okay, let's try to frog it so see if I can save the yarn, you know? And I started pulling it out and I've frogged mohair before. So I'm familiar with how unpleasant that is, but this was just another level. The fact that it was being held together with this like really crispy linen just made the frogging absolute hell. And I'm not, uh, not super sensitive about things like that. You know, I can deal with some annoyance, but this, I was like, there are not enough hours in the day. Like my life is more valuable. My time is more valuable than, than dealing with frogging this. So I'm just gonna cut the sleeve off and just call it a loss, throw the sleeve away and you know, go on with my life. So I had apparently done a pretty good job of picking up those stitches from the armhole and knitting down because I could barely feel a ridge where those stitches were picked up. And so I looked at the body and, you know, I was pretty sure that I was leaving a whole pattern repeat between where I was cutting the sleeve off and where the body actually started. You guys, I almost cut into the body. It was like two rows, literally two rows away from the edge of this body where this, the scissor cut was. And when I realized that I was like, now if I had done that, I could have come back down below the armhole, picked up all those stitches again, <laughs> 
more carefully cut off the top of the body and then re-knit the top and, and the back. If I had done that though, I don't think I would have had like the mental fortitude to to go on. I, I already wasn't really enjoying this project by the end. There's something about the stitch pattern that although it's beautiful, I just wasn't super into it, especially after having knit the entire body and then knit an entire sleeve and frogging it and all that. And I'm not sure that I would have been able to go on. I might have had to scrap the entire thing. But luckily that didn't happen. I, by pure luck, managed to not cut the, into the body of this thing. And I just finished the armholes with the eye cord and went on my way. So that is my second finished object. For my works in progress, both of which are new, the first one I have to show you is from this book by Marie Wallen, but it is not a color work project. So this is her Cherish book, which I think is a relatively recent release, maybe last couple years. And this book I was perplexed by at first, and I still sort of am, because she, so since she has come up with her British Breeds yarn line that was being produced by John Arbin, she wanted to reissue a lot of her older patterns and updated some of the sizes, but some of them, I'm not sure if there were really a whole lot of changes to the pattern. They were just re-knit in the British Breeds yarn, but then given a, a new name in this book. So it's a little bit odd. Uh, it makes finding things in Ravelry a little bit challenging, I think but some of the patterns have been totally reworked. For example, the one that I am working on, I think was previously written at a bulky weight and it has been converted to be written at a fingering weight. So that project is this one, which is called Colleen. And it is a very heavily cabled cardigan, which is just sort of hard to see with the way it's been photographed. And this photo is maybe a little bit lighter. The other thing that's a little bit perplexing about this book is that the whole book is meant to show off her yarn, but the quality of the photographs is very sort of like there's a, a filter on it that reduces the saturation. And it's like, if you're trying to show off the, the yarn colors, that doesn't make a whole ton of sense to me, but whatever. That's the project that I'm making. And I'm not using the British Breeds yarn, but let me show it to you first. I've really gotten a long way. <laughs> I've been sort of working on this on and off since August, but it wasn't interesting for a long time. Uh, so I have the back and one of the fronts done. So here it is. You can really see the cables a lot more clearly in this lighter color yarn. So what we're looking at here is the back. So you can see there's a panel that is heavily cabled and it's separated from the other side of the back by this rib which if I come up close, you can maybe see is, uh, it's two by two rib, but every other column is, has a, a one by one cross, like a one by one twist teeny cable. So this is a lot of cable, <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot. It's very beautiful. It's very time intensive. So the back of this also is <laughs> rather large, won't all fit in the frame. Uh, the pattern I think comes in three sizes and they're all meant to be worn with some, you know, relatively large amount of ease. The smallest size, which is the one I'm making, is a finished flat measurement of 24 and a half inches. And the largest size is 31 and a half inches flat, so 62 inches in circumference. The other thing to note with a garment shape like this, where both of the fronts and the back meet at a point, at the back of the neck is that the fronts are going to ride up in the front. And this is a completely legitimate garment shape. I've seen people like grumping about this, like it's not uh, designed properly, but that's how this is meant to fit. So once this goes around the back of your neck and the fronts are, are draping down around the curve of your shoulder and around your bust, particularly, you know, you might need to take into account how, um, how much your bust protrudes, the front, it is going to have a high low hem effect. So that is, that's the intent of a garment shape like this. She does have a number of patterns that are, are shaped in that way. And I really like that fit, but I also don't have much of a bust to contend with. So the effect is more subtle on me than it might be on some others. The yarn I'm using for this is my favorite neutral Jameson and Smith colorway. I talked about this in the last episode as well. This is the same main color I'm using for my Ralph vest. This is Jameson and Smith, uh, Shetland Supreme in the 2006 colorway. 
I just love this color. It's like a nice oatmeal. Uh, I have gotten multiple dye lots of this before and sometimes they are a little more gray. Sometimes they're a little bit more warm, like browny. This is a little bit more brown than the dye lot I'm using on my Ralph. It's very subtle, but you know, you're staring at a, a garment like this. You notice those type of things. And so here you can see the front. So I have attached this already with a three needle bind off. The pattern was written to have a stepwise bind off for the shoulder, which would also have been not a problem to seam that, but whenever I, I see that, I do like doing a three needle bind off just because it's easier for me. So I did some German short rows here instead. So here is what this looks like from the front. Here is what that three needle bind off seam looks like. You will notice that because of the way this cable pattern is structured, the cables don't match up at the shoulder. It's just, that's the way it is. The repeats sort of match up visually. You can tell there's like three main cable repeats, but it's not one of those that's designed in a way where these will go seamlessly into each other across this seam. And here you can see I have all of my stitches for the right back on hold. And once I have that right front completed, I'm going to use the three needle bind off again to attach them along here. So you can see how that point at the back of the neck is going to be. The other thing to note about this cable chart is that it's not symmetrical. So when I had first started this and I was on the back and I looked at the chart and realized that it was not going to be symmetrical across the midline, I did look at that chart for about five minutes to see if I could <laughs> flip it if it would make sense to flip it and honestly I don't think it does. The way that it's written you're you're probably not going to want to mess with that just because it's a little bit at least for me it was a little bit too complicated to want to mess with flipping it. The other thing that I have noticed since I started working a little bit of the chart is that the things that you really notice that are symmetrical in the pattern are these diagonal lines. Like these are the things that visually stand out when you're viewing it from a little bit further back, not the fact that like these little twisty cables are not symmetrical on either end. Like the diagonal lines are the strong motif, if that makes any sense. So that is the Colleen pattern. Did I say the name of that? Colleen is what it's called in this book. I still have the entire right front to go. And the other thing that I am considering doing yet again is leaving the sleeves off and just making this sort of a big oversized, like almost a Ruana, but I will seam the sides. So I, I think Ruanas have open sides, don't they? I'm thinking about doing this for a couple of reasons. One, I need more vests in my life. Two, the pattern on the sleeves is completely different from the pattern on the body, which I find to be a little bit odd. I know I could totally change that, but when I look at the way the sleeve is coming off of the body, and it's it's hard to tell in this photo because this the, these photos are just sort of dark and unclear, but there's a very weird line created by picking it up off of this drop shoulder on the body. There's something about that that looks strange to me, and it looks strange in a lot of the existing projects that are on Ravelry already. So, like, there's something going on there. I'm sure I could figure out how to pick up a sleeve off that and knit down, which might give a little bit of a less bumpy effect, that join where the, the shoulder joins the sleeve because the way the pattern is written is to knit the sleeves bottom up and then seam. I also considered changing the pattern on the sleeves to maybe a rib, just doing a long ribbed sleeve or doing, you know, some amount of cabling to match the body and then some longer rib. But I'm going to wait and see if I finish the front and attach it. If I like the way it looks as a vest, I'm going to leave it. If I do at that point think it will look better with sleeves, I'll go ahead and figure something out. But I do suspect that this is gonna look sort of cute as a vest, so we will see. For my other work in progress, I am going to have to restrain myself because I am so excited about this project and about this pattern. So in the last six months or so, I have started to get interested in Japanese pattern books. And I had heard, you know, here and there, people talking about knitting from a Japanese pattern and how it's, you know, largely charted and that sort of thing. But I had never really tried to seek them out as far as ordering books from Japan or anything like that. So I'm going to do another video in the new year of talking more about Japanese pattern books and how I got into them. But, um, uh, I'm just going to show this one that I am knitting out of right now and we'll talk about the pattern a little bit and then I'll sort of talk more about Japanese patterns in general later. 
So this is the book that I'm using. I will put the ISBN number down in the description box if you are interested in this because if you don't speak Japanese, like good luck <laughs> finding this. I have purchased most of my Japanese knitting books because I now have like an entire collection that has built up over the last six months or so. Uh, I have ordered most of them from sellers on Etsy. If you go to Etsy and you just search Japanese knitting books, you'll see there are a couple sellers that have a lot of sales and I have ordered from multiple of those folks. So let me show you the project first and then we'll talk about the pattern. <laughs> it's almost done because I've had so much fun working on this. So here it is. And you might recognize this yarn as the yarn that Miga gave me when I met up with her for the Vermont Sheep and Wool Festival. This is the Woodsong Farm DK weight. 100% fin sheep, which is hand dyed. It is beautiful. And I had originally been planning on making a Nora Gone pattern out of her knit fold pleat repeat book. And so I had swatched for that. So here is my swatch. You can see like it's got nice stitch definition. The, the color is just beautifully tonal. I really loved how this swatch was coming across. And so I actually started that Nora Gone pattern but very quickly realized I wasn't gonna have enough yarn. Like I, I had calculated, you know, I knit a certain amount and then calculated, am I really gonna have enough yarn for this? Cause I was sort of cutting it close and there was just no way I was gonna be able to finish it. So I'm not able to get more of this yarn because they are sold out in this colorway at, at the moment. And so I was like, okay, I gotta choose something else. So here is the pattern as shown in the book. And you can see I chose this one because I, so full disclosure, I am taking a beginning Japanese class, but I have zero ability to read any of this really uh, at this time. So I wanted to choose a pattern that looked relatively simple in construction. So this is a drop shoulder. Uh, it's knit from the bottom up. It's just got some simple cables here and the sleeves, which sort of pushed me over the edge in terms of deciding to make this. I thought that this was just so interesting that the sleeves are open. And you can see, you know, if you're wearing like a puffy sleeve shirt or something underneath there, the, the sleeve of your shirt can sort of poke out a little bit. And I just, I thought that that was so interesting. And I just, at that point, I wanted to make this. So I did decide, uh, as you can see, this is quite short. And I did lengthen the body. I'm feeling like it's a little bit hard to talk about this project without doing a deep dive into Japanese patterns and how they're written and, and going into that, but we'll deal with that in a later video. Just a couple of things to note about Japanese patterns. So cons for non-Japanese speakers is obviously the whole thing's in Japanese. Um, they are usually only written for one size and that size is usually rather small. And so you need to do some working with gauge or and or some altering the pattern to make it fit you if you are larger than i would assume maybe a 31 inch bust 31 32 inch bust i would assume is average for the people in these photos who are modeling the actual garments so the pros are the patterns are extremely clearly laid out because Japanese is a very context heavy language. And so the way these patterns have been developed, you know, over the years of sort of stylistic pattern writing is there's a very small box of description that's written out. So if you use an app on your phone, like uh, Google Lens, which I recently discovered, I don't know how I didn't know about this before, but you can basically just hover your phone over the text and it will automatically translate it. And so with Japanese, sometimes you get sort of funny translation because it's so context heavy uh, as far as how the language is written. So just for example, so I'm gonna hold this far enough away that I'm hopefully not giving anything away, but you can hopefully see that we have a bunch of schematics here and this is really the pattern. There are numbers, there are stitch counts, there are measurements for each section, how long things need to be. You can see that there are some different colors. Those indicate stitch patterns. So, you know, if you're working in this, this section here, that's a light pink, you're using the light pink stitch pattern, which is the cable pattern. And then there's just a little bit of text up here. So the actual numbers on the patterns are written using the same numbers that you use on, a, on an English keyboard. They're not written using the, the traditional Japanese characters. So you can read all the numbers on the pattern. 
but when you see certain symbols, like the apps will want to translate them um, in ways that are a little bit funny, but you can sort of get the gist. So you can see like 124, and then there's this little symbol right here that's a box with like three, three sections. What I mean by context heavy as a language is that that symbol generally has to do with things like the eye or like to look at something or like the the kanji characters can have multiple different meanings that are they tend to be sort of related and so in this context that symbol means stitch but the apps will often want to translate it as eyes so it will say like 124 eyes but it's it's actually meaning stitch it's like the apps haven't caught up to the complexity of the language being used in this context because I'm sure that this isn't like the focus of Google app developers is like translating Japanese knitting patterns using Google Lens, you know. And then on the second page of this pattern, you can see even more in-depth charts that show you like, for example, here's the neckline, right? And it shows you exactly how many stitches to be binding off. So you're told those numbers on, on the first page. Like there's a way, which we'll talk about in the future, that the decreases are written for a neckline, for example. And that way is not the same way that you would write them in an English pattern. But when you turn the next page and look at the chart, it's entirely charted out. So not all Japanese patterns are like that, where they, they chart out everything, but a lot of them are. Ones that are in books that I have purchased tend to be that way. So let me show you my garment again. I have finished the body and the body is blocked. Because it's a drop shoulder, I wanted to be sure to block the body before I started doing the sleeves so that my sleeves would end up being the right length. So the construction of this is, it is knit flat, front and back are knit separately from the bottom up. You could easily turn that into being knit in the round if you wanted to. And then you start this cable pattern do some neck shaping. There was, was there shoulder shaping? I think I added shoulder shaping. That was the other thing I did. I just added a couple short rows to give just a tiny bit of shoulder shaping here. And then I have started the first sleeve. And so you do seam the shoulder first, which I again did with a three needle bind off. And then you pick up stitches along this flat piece of the front and back and you knit the sleeve down. So eventually I'm going, once the sleeve is completed, well, let's talk about the sleeve. So the sleeve has the same pattern as on the body, just a simple cable and broken rib pattern here. And then I recently started doing stockinette for the bottom portion of the sleeve. And then at the cuff, I will go back into the round and knit the cuff in the round. And so the sleeve will be entirely open, as we saw, to the armpit, and then the side will be seamed. Okay, on the back you can see where I extended the body quite a bit. So this is where the body should have ended, according to the pattern, and I added another couple of inches there, just because I didn't want it to be too short, you know. The pattern in the book barely covers, you know, the, the mountaintop, so I wanted that to be a little bit longer. Here you can see the yarn again. I am alternating skeins. I feel like I just have a million balls <laughs> laying around. There are some skeins of this. It's a little bit hard to tell because we've got super bright natural light today, but some of these skeins have little pops of yellow that are more prominent than others, so I am alternating as much as possible the whole time. And so that is sort of flying by. You know, it's a nice large gauge. Oh, so as far as editing the pattern so that it will fit me. So because my bust is, I am assuming, at least three and a half, four inches, maybe more, uh, bigger around than the model. And my shoulders are almost certainly broader because that's just sort of the standard for my body. Um, I assumed that I was going to need to alter this pattern in some way. Although the pattern has a finished circumference of, I think 124 centimeters, hold on. 126 centimeters is the finished bust on this. It's sort of um, meaningless because that is going to be enough ease to get around my body, but I'm not going to have the same amount of ease that the model in the pattern has. So I had assumed that I needed to add a couple of inches in some way to the body, either by adding another repeat on either side of the, the shoulder or by playing with the gauge. 
And so in this instance, I decided to play with the gauge. So in a Japanese pattern, you can find the gauge usually somewhere at the top. This right here says gauge, which is Japanese for gauge. And so over here, we have the two different gauges for the two different stitch patterns. So the one on the top is the stockinette gauge, and then we have the, the um, cable gauge. Japanese needle sizes are also different than both millimeters and US sizes. So I basically just ignore them. Uh, I would like to get some Japanese knitting needles. I think that would be cool, but I don't have them. So I am just going by the gauge basically. So the gauge as written for stockinette in this pattern is 22 stitches by 27 rows over 10 centimeters. And so I did a little bit of math and I reasoned that I can actually get something more like 20 and a half to 21 stitches as far as the width. And that would give me just a couple more inches of ease across the body that would then hopefully help this fit me with the same amount of ease that it fits this model. Playing with the gauge like that is not something that will always work. Like for example, if there's a garment that's knitted with a single strand of mohair and you want to make that garment significantly bigger, just making the gauge, you know, using a bigger needle, to some extent you can do that, but if you're trying to, to make it much bigger, that won't work. You know, you're not going to get the same quality of fabric as the original garment. And so at that point you would need to think more about where to add that additional width on the garment so that it will fit you. Part of the reason I chose this pattern for my first sort of foray into Japanese knitting patterns is because the construction of it was so simple and also the fitting of it is going to be simple. You know, a drop shoulder with plenty of ease I know is going to fit my body to some degree at least. <laughs> And it's not something like a fitted set in sleeve sweater that I'm trying to size up for my first experience with a pattern in, in another language. So the designs in this particular book are all by Aiko Matsumoto, as far as I can tell. And I just wanna show you, I am obsessed with this book. There is a lot in here that I wanna make. There are some patterns that include crochet as well. And my crochet skills really need to get a lot better before I try to do something like this, but like here, I really like this, and these sleeves are crocheted. Oh my god, I really like that. Here's another one I want to make. This has like a really interesting sort of broken rib looking texture on the body, and then mohair gathered sleeves. Oh, love that. I love the fringe on the underside of these arms. This book just has so many interesting details in the sweaters. I really, I love how they're all photographed. I love sort of the styling, you know, oversized uh, layering. That's just, you know, speaks to me. It's hard to see because it's so bright, but like there's little notches in the hem of this one and just little things like that, you know, lots of details. But here's another one. Look at the sleeves on this. Like we have a, a slightly striped body. I think these are two different kinds of yarn. And then, you know, nice big cabled sleeves. You guys know how I love a sleeve like this. Anyway, this is one of my favorite books that I have. I could go on and on, but I, I have amassed quite a collection. So I think that we will talk about this more in depth in the future. Let me know how interested you are in learning more about these types of patterns because I could do sort of like a special video about them. And I'm not an authority by any means, obviously. I've just started sort of getting into these patterns, but that might be sort of an interesting point to show you what I would do, you know, as far as deciding how to size things up and, and that sort of thing. So at any rate, I'll be taking you along with me for some more Japanese patterns in the future. So that is all that I have for you today. Fingers crossed for me that I'm able to finish all this stuff by the end of the year and you will know soon enough whether I was able to do that or not. I hope everyone is having a nice holiday season so far and I will see you again before the end of the year. Thanks so much for being here and I will see you next time. Bye!